Hello and welcome to Kangaroo English. My name is Christian and today is Wednesday, the best day of the week. <laughs> um, now, you may or may not know that I have a Facebook group and the Facebook group is a place where people can uh, express themselves and they can also ask questions and I, I answer those questions. And... Um, Yesterday, I was looking through the questions, and th there was just this one question, right? One sentence. The question was, do we need grammar? <laughs> do we need grammar? I mean, <laughs> well, <sighs> I mean, it's, it's a great question, actually. It's, it's a kind of deep question. And it takes us on this journey, this journey from, um, from like the origin of language through the history of, of, of methods, all the way to answering the question, do you need to study grammar to be successful at learning a language? So let's go on this journey, okay? Um, and I think we need to start with... Um, a common kind of myth, because there's a few myths in this video that I want to kind of destroy, right? Um, so the, the first one is that some people think that some languages don't have grammar, right? And for some reason in the kind of Anglo-Saxon world, you know, so like, you know, Britain, Australia, America, you know, they like to say that Chinese has no grammar, you know, Mandarin has no grammar, apparently. It's a language without grammar. Um, which, of course, is absolutely and totally not true. Language cannot exist without grammar. Um, because, you know, when, when, when people think about grammar and what grammar is, you know, they might think about something like this, right? The Oxford Modern English Grammar, it's kind of a really dense you know, 200, 300 pages of, of description about, you know, the English language. Um, you know, they might think that this is grammar, right? Or maybe the stuff that they find in their workbook um, is grammar. You know, these kind of fill in the blanks or descriptions about constructions. You know, this, this is grammar. Um, I have to wash my hands after touching a workbook. <laughs> Dirty thing. I <laughs> normally I would burn this, but um, I'm saving it for for to use as an example in videos. <laughs> um, but 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 really, let's let's answer the question: what what grammar is? So, if if we look in some dictionaries, like if we look in um, the Oxford Dictionary, the the definitions are quite kind of um, kind of dense, right? The whole system and structure of a language. Syntax, morphology, including inflections, uh, and there's like five sub-definitions. Um, Merriam-Webster is um, the study of the classes of words, their inflections. Um, again, talks a lot about syntax inflections, but I think that the Cambridge Dictionary nailed it, nailed the definition. This is the definition, ready? The way you combine words and change their form and position in the sentence or the rules of this, right? That's grammar. So language can't exist without grammar because even the tiniest, the tiniest change to a word or the order of words is grammar. You know, like in English, for example, you know, we say, I do like pizza. I do like pizza. I do like pizza. This is a, a statement, a declarative statement of fact, of truth. I, you know, I, I do like pizza. I love pizza. <laughs> if we want to turn that into a question, we change the word order. Do I like pizza? Right? So this, this, this kind of rule, this system, this way of combining words is grammar. It's not particularly complicated, but it's grammar. Other languages, like, for example, Mandarin, you know, they might not have 
verb conjugations for the future, for example, things like that. But doesn't mean they don't have grammar. They have other ways of, um, you know, expressing these very important concepts. Of course, that's how human language works. And there's this kind of general balance, right? So <laughs> it's not really true that all languages are equally complicated, right? Or equally complex. It's not really true. But it's kind of true that, you know, that all languages are complex in some way that's different from another language. Like, uh, for example, you know, English is very simple in its verbs. You know, we only have three kind of conjugations, three forms in total. But it's complex, for example, in prepositions. Whereas Spanish, you know, is super complex in the verb department. There's like a <laughs> hundred verb forms for, for every verb, you know. But it might be really simple in conjugations, for example. So, you know, there's always this kind of balance between the way that languages are complicated. Um, so, the, kind of one of the questions, before we can answer the main question, which is, do you need to study grammar to learn a language? We, it would be good, I think it would be good to ask, where does grammar come from? You know, did it, was there like cavemen one day and they sort of went, oh, and then someone went, oh, oh and then, <laughs> and then it just became a language. Is that, is that what happened? Basically, yes. Okay. So there's this amazing study from, uh, 2019, uh, Manuel Bon, Gregor Katchel and Michael Tomasello, uh, this is the paper, okay? Young children spontaneously recreate core properties of language in a new modality. Big complicated name, super simple idea, okay? So they wanted to know if children would spontaneously invent a new language. So what they did was they put them in two separate rooms, okay? There's actually a, a diagram here of, of what they did, okay? So they put them in two separate rooms with, with webcams and they were having conversations over Skype in the two separate rooms, right? And they had to play a game. They had this little spinning wheel. Okay, you can see the wheel in the picture. They had this spinning wheel. And so they'd spin the wheel and whatever the picture was, they had to describe that picture to the other person and the other person had to guess the picture. E easy game, right? But the researchers were very sneaky, very tricky. And in the middle of this, um, in the middle of this game, they cut the audio, right? So there was only, there was only video. So now they had to invent sign language, right? And this has happened before. In the 90s, there was a language that spontaneously appeared, Nicaraguan sign language, okay? But this is the first time that it's been studied in a laboratory. And what they discovered, and let me read from the, from, the, um, from, the, from the abstract, okay? Here we show how young children, because the children were between four and eight, I think. Here we show how young children create new communication systems that exhibit core features of natural languages in less than 30 minutes. Less than 30 minutes. Spontaneous language creation. Incredible. So, you know, some of the, some of the, 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 the pictures they had to describe were kind of easy, right? So they had to describe, for example, uh, a bicycle. And that's kind of easy because you can do the, you know, you can do the bicycle. Um, or they had to describe a duck. You know, so you do the duck. <laughs> right, duck. So, so these were kind of easy, but then the researchers also got them to do more abstract concepts. And this is when things get really interesting. Okay, so one of the pictures was actually a blank picture. It was nothing. So how do you describe nothing without words, you know, with, with a gesture? How do you describe nothing? So some of the children kind of did this. Or this, like, like nothing, 
nothing to show nothing. But one of the children had a, a colored shirt on with a white spot. And so the, 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 the child is going, look, look at the white spot. Mm -hmm. And, and eventually the kid in the other room is like, oh, okay, I get it. White, nothing. Ah, oh, perfect. Right. But then of course, what happened was the next time they repeat the gesture. Okay. It's just this. Even if you don't have a white spot on your shirt, because they share this symbol of communication. I could be wearing a completely black shirt with no white spots. I could be wearing, I could be wearing nothing. And I do this. And because we share this symbol, because we agreed before, okay, we agreed that that's what that means, this gesture, suddenly, spontaneously, we have an abstract gesture that means nothing. Nothing. All right. The origin is some kid with a shirt with a white spot. That's the origin. But now it has become this shared symbol. Okay. And this is, this is how grammar emerges. So that's a word meaning. And then the researchers also got them to indicate quantity and size, right? So if you're doing one duck, how do you do multiple ducks? The children had various techniques for, for creating multiple ducks or multiple bicycles or showing the size of things, big and small, right? They had, they had, systems that spontaneously appeared to describe these things, right? So this is, this is really important research, right? But now, now that we know how grammar emerges, okay, grammar emerges in communities between people that are communicating, now we can start to answer the question, is it necessary for you as a student to study grammar? Right. And <laughs> I, I want to talk a little bit about this, this, this other piece of research, okay, by Shana Poplak, Lydia Gabriella Jamas, and Natalie Dion and Nicole Rosen, okay, which is called Searching for Standard French, the Construction of and Mining of the, oh boy, here we go, Recré Historique de Grammaire du Français. I apologize for my French pronunciation. Um, now, Shana Poplak is an amazing researcher and academic. I cannot tell you how much admiration I have for her work, okay? Um, you know, her work is really careful and detailed, and it has lots of data. You know, some research is like, you know, 20 kids. Here we're talking about her research normally involves thousands or millions of, of data points, right? So it's, it's great research. And what they did was they looked at the history of French prescriptivism. Okay, so maybe you know, maybe you don't, that the French language has this deep history that is kind of linked to the uh, Academy uh, Francais, I think, L'Académie Francais, I don't know, I can't remember uh, what it's called. Um, so they, they, there's basically this kind of group of French academics who, who kind of decide what is right and what is wrong in French. And they, you know, they basically dictate, they prescribe what's correct and what's not. This is kind of unique. You know, there are 7,000 languages in the world. There are very few, maybe a dozen, that have this kind of system, right? And the, 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 the French Academy, right, the, the French Academy are kind of respected by the French people, um, as far as I know. I don't know if that's true universally, but they're kind of respected. So people listen to their, their opinions about what's correct and what's not in French. You know, the, the, the French Academy would have influence over, for example, what is printed by the French government, what is printed in newspapers, what's printed in, um, you know, how people use French on the news, for example. So, you know, they have a lot of power, 
to control language change in theory, right? In theory. Um, and so what they did was they looked at the history of these prescription rules. Okay, so I want to show you just one, one graph here. And this is a super interesting graph. Okay, so here you can see from all the way from 1500 until 1999. And the, the top line, the, the, the black line at the top, shows how often they, they give a rule about excluding the conditional from the protasis. So basically, it's, it's a rule, right, that the, that the French Academy are giving. It. They're like, don't do this. And you can see that, you know, it's risen, it's gone up from 40% in 1500 to 70% in 1999. So if you pick up a French grammar book, 70% of those books are going to say, don't do this, right? And, and well, this is a, a secondary thing, which is kind of interesting to me, but, but you can see as well, the dotted line at the bottom over time is how they are basically qualifying the rule. So basically, they're giving a reason why, not just saying, don't do this. They're saying, don't do this because it makes you sound stupid, or it makes you sound like a foreigner, or um, it could, uh, I don't know, make you sound like you're uneducated, right? For example, so, <clears throat> so not only, so they're giving the rule more often, and they're also giving reasons more often. So don't do it, and don't do it because of this. It's going up, going up. 70% of the books, all right? But then, Shana and her team, the legend, they looked at what is actually happening in the reality of the French language. You know, not what is in the grammar books, but what, it, what are people actually using? And, well, guess what? Here's the graph. And as you can see, <laughs> it's risen from 13% in the 19th century to 78% in the 21st century. So, so the, 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 the French Academy are prescribing this rule, right? They're saying, don't do this. And yet, the people are doing the exact opposite, okay? The, the, the increase is astronomically increasing, okay? That was a terrible sentence. Um, and this, this is the conclusion. This is the abstract from the paper. Listen, as a result... Grammar and usage are evolving independently. This is just an example, okay? Everywhere they looked, they found the same thing. There's no relationship between this, okay, this and the reality of what people are doing. So, to answer the question, can you learn a language without studying grammar? The first thing I want to say is absolutely yes. How do I know? Because this and this have only existed for, let's say, a hundred years, right? And, and what, when I say a hundred years, I mean existed in, you know, in mass education. Because remember that you know, mass compulsory education is a very, 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 very new thing, right? Um, 500 years ago, you know, a majority of people had no education of any kind. This is very, very new. If language has existed for a million years, this is like a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of a second of existence of this. So, geez, um... How did people learn languages for all those millions of years? <laughs> for a million years. How did people learn languages if they didn't have grammar books? Hmm. I, they learned them through contact, you know, through usage, through conversations, through necessity. Buying things, selling things, uh, you know, moving to a safer place, escaping danger. Um, you know... <laughs> The historical record shows that that this is not necessary to learn a language, okay? But having said that, having said that, um, you know, 
learning a language only, let's say only through, you know, watching television and, and having conversations, you know, that's not the most efficient way to learn a language. Okay. We have, you know, this, this might not reflect what people are doing, but it gives you a really solid foundation, right? And, you know, the ideal thing is to, is to take advantage of these resources. You know, people who are learning English are lucky because they have access to some of the best descriptions of, of, of any language that have ever been written, you know, um, if you want to go and learn, uh, you know, a small language that's spoken by somebody in the Amazon, it's, it's very, very difficult because there's no, there's no information about how the language works and there's no way to practice with practice activities, you know, so studying, explicitly studying grammar and explicitly studying, you know, constructions and vocabulary, that's a necessary thing, right? No, I shouldn't say necessary. It's an efficient way to study a language. You want to do some of that, right? But you don't want to do 100% of that. You want to do maybe, you know, 25% explicit study, 75% other things, language usage, you know, reading, conversation, uh, repetition of practice, same things, you know, practicing the things you already know, fluency development. Um, and so... From this tiny question about do we need grammar, we've kind of taken a little tour, you know, through language evolution and the history of grammar and especially French grammar. And now we arrive at the answer, which is um, a little bit of this and a little <laughs> reminds me of the chicken dance. A little bit of this and a little bit of that, and take your hand. Bam, bam. Um, <laughs> it's Wednesday. Come on. Um, I hope that you. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed this video, um, and I hope that now you feel more ready to accept, but also reject the truth about the importance of of grammar study. Uh, I'm Christian, this is Kangaroo English, and, and I'll see you in class.